Uh, my name is Heidi St. John. I'm excited to be here today. Uh, I remember getting a call from my assistant, Melissa, telling me about the ladies' tea here and what was going on. But when I heard the theme, my heart just sort of quickened because for those of you who follow me, anybody who has seen me or knows anything about me, you will know that my passion uh, is to just equip women in the word of God and to remind you of who you are in the Lord. And so that's why I'm here today. I never uh, like to start speaking without asking the Lord to join me. I am a mother of seven children. My oldest daughter, Savannah, is in the back. Savannah, wave, say hello. So you guys are going to think she's 14. She's not. She's almost 27. So I know. She's like, oh, man. Last night, or yesterday on the airplane, the flight attendants were like, oh, you brought your daughter with you. How old are you? 15? And she was like, no, I have two children. I'm like, be nice. <laughs> So Savannah's the oldest of our seven, uh, so our kids range in age from 27 all the way down to seven years old. So we're doing something in our house we like to call diapers to diploma. And uh, so I'm very, very much still uh, on the motherhood journey, and I hope that what the Lord has put on my heart for you today blesses and encourages you. Before uh, I get started, would you mind bowing your heads with me? Let's invite him to join us. Father God, we come before you this afternoon here in Boston, and we just want to say thank you. We want to say thank you for the freedom that we enjoy in this nation. We want to say thank you, Father, for the privilege of raising children, of being an influencer over this generation. Father, I pray that you would open our eyes to the spiritual battle that's being fought all around us, Father, and that you would strengthen us by your spirit. Lord, I pray that you would speak through me today. Father, I pray that you'd empty me of myself. Lord, we don't need to hear any more worldly wisdom. We need to hear from you. Father, I pray that you would speak through my broken places and that you would remind me of what I want to remind these women of today, and that is that your strength is actually found in our weakness, and we thank you for that. But more than anything, Father, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you that you look down on this broken, fallen world that's not operating the way that you intended, and you gave us your son. What an incredible example, Father, that you set for us. So as we talk about kind of the ups and the downs of the culture and what's going on today in our world, Lord, I pray that you'd strengthen us for battle. And I pray, Father, that if a word comes out of my mouth or to my mind that these women aren't supposed to hear, that they would just be deaf to it and that you just speak through me, Lord, by the power of your spirit. We welcome you here, Lord Jesus, and it is in your name I pray. Amen. So Psalm 144, verse 1, you guys all have this on your, uh, on your little take home. It says, Praise be to the Lord my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. You know, I've been looking around the culture like many of you. I think things are pretty similar here in Boston, Massachusetts, as they are in the Pacific Northwest. So I do a lot of traveling. I'm going to go home uh, tomorrow, and then I'm going to grab uh, my husband and our four youngest children who are still at home, and we're going to get on a plane Monday. And we'll be in South Carolina speaking for a conference there. And then we'll be driving down the eastern seaboard to Orlando and speaking again. And what's interesting to me to note that is in all of my years of speaking, I have never seen the culture shifting as rapidly as it is shifting now. Have you guys noticed that? Have you seen a culture shift that's happening? We're going to talk a little bit about the culture shift and what's happening in the world today because if we're going to engage it the way that Jesus wants us to, we got to know what we're up against. And since I speak a lot in the, uh, in the Bible Belt, you know, I just got back uh, last weekend I was in Mobile, Alabama, and I, I said, you know, a lot of times they'll ask me where I'm from if I hadn't had a chance to speak yet, and I say, oh, I'm from Portland, Oregon, and almost always this is the response I get, oh my goodness, girl, you are living at the gates of hell, <laughs> right, you ever get that, yeah, that's right, or do you guys ever get that here? It's because the people in the Bible Belt are afraid of us, right? Because they're looking at what's happening in the, in the country, and they see sort of the, the microcosm of it happening on the left coast and on the east coast, on the right coast and the left coast, right? But the truth is, according to the Bible, this is happening everywhere. It's not just on the coast, and it's in the Bible Belt. That's why I always like to scare them. I'm like, I know that you guys think it's just, in, it's just out in Portland, but it's not. It's here in Mobile. Sorry, I don't mean to ruin your day, right? And it's amazing to me because what I'm noticing is we're living in a generation of biblically illiterate Christians. So men and women who know the word of God, or they should know it, so we've grown up in the church, we should know the word of God, but we don't really know it and we can't defend it. And we can't stand on it. So today I'm going to take you, first of all, to Psalm 127. I have so much to say to you. I'm so excited. My heart is pounding. I'm going to try to do this in an hour. I'm sorry I'm talking fast. Take notes fast. You keep up with me. 
All right, I have so much I told on. I'm like, I don't know if I can get all this into an hour. But the Lord's going to help me. I'm going to start in Psalm 127. And if you're taking notes, this is a great thing to write down. This should be the battle cry of every single woman in this room. And by the way, this message is not just for mothers. I'm going to get to it. But the Bible has something to say to you if you have influence in the life of a child. If you have influence in the life of someone who's younger than you, then the Bible has already told you what you are supposed to do. So let's, let's find out what he has to say, starting in Psalm 127. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go to, red, go to late rest eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives sleep to his beloved. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. I'm going to stop right there. Because this is so counter to the culture. The culture will teach you that children are a burden. God says that they're a blessing. God says that your children are a blessing, that they've been given to you as arrows in the hands of a warrior. This illusion over and over and over, this, uh, the, the, you'll see the psalmist David and you'll see the, uh, the apostle John and you'll see Peter doing it over and over and over again. Moses in the book of Deuteronomy telling you that you are engaged in a spiritual battle. Now listen to what the Bible goes on to say. It says, children are a gift from the Lord. They're a heritage. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are the children born to us when we are young. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He will not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies at the gate. So interesting to me to note that our culture has so devalued human life that we no longer see children as a blessing from the Lord, but we see them as an inconvenience. We do everything we can to limit the sizes of our families. I'm not here to preach about having a bunch of babies. I don't actually, I think everybody's quiver is a little bit different. What I want to do is encourage you to see children the way that God sees them. We want to see children the way that God sees them. We want to see everything that we do in this life, we want to see it as women of faith the way that God sees it because God says that his blessings are never found outside of his boundaries. I don't know if you're noticing this right now, but we are living in a world that is absolutely starving for identity. I was telling Alana this last night. I believe we're facing a full-blown identity crisis in the United States. We are in a crisis of epic proportions. We are in such a crisis right now that we no longer are willing to identify as men and women. We would rather say, oh, you can be whatever you want, which, by the way, according to God's word, is a lie. Because God said in Genesis, I made you male and female in my image. You are image bearers. Women, daughters of the King of Kings, of the Lord Most High. God said, I loved you. I sent my son for you. The world is going to tell you right now that there is no such thing as truth and that your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth. But God said, Jesus said in John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He said, no man comes to the Father but by me. And so we know that truth is not a subjective thing. Truth exists and it's found in the word of God. In Psalm 119, we read, teach me your word, which is truth. Guide me in your truth and teach me. In John 17, 17, we read Jesus saying again that his word is true, that his righteous laws are eternal. And for some reason, Christians in this generation, I believe because we are living in such an incredible time of deception. I don't know if you guys, I've never seen anything like this in my life. All right, I've only been walking around this earth for about 49 years, and I've never seen anything like this in my life. I've never seen so many Christians afraid to get onto the battlefield. So I'm here today, and my, my whole mission here today is to encourage you, A, to remind you that you're in a spiritual battle. If the psalmist David said that your children have been given to you like arrows in the hands of a warrior, and 1 Peter in 1 Peter 5, 8 said, look out, be on the alert. You have an adversary the devil who prowls around like a roaring lion, literally seeking someone to devour. The Bible says that you have an adversary, the accuser of your soul, and his name is Satan. And the way he's operating in the culture right now is through deception. Have you noticed that? We are living in a time of incredible deception. And from what I can tell, it's sort of the perfect storm, right? An incredible cloud of deception has fallen over the world and a generation of biblically illiterate Christians. 
women and men who no longer know the word of God and they cannot defend it. The Bible says in Ephesians that we are in a, in a, in a battle with an adversary that we can't see. And he says, pick up the battles of spiritual warfare. So I run a, a, an, an international ministry to women called Mom Strong International. And the whole goal over there is to get women into the word of God. And this month we're studying strategies in spiritual warfare. One of the first things that Paul tells you to do is to pick up the shield of faith. What's faith? Faith is believing. It's taking something at face value. So as believers, as, as Christians, we take the word of God at face value. And we say that the word of God, are like, that the laws of God, which govern the universe, by the way, which make the sun come up in the morning and go down with accuracy that we can predict to within seconds, right? The same God that made the sun and the moon and the world around us is the one who governs our lives, is the authority over our lives, which by the way, that's what we're rebelling against, right? Because we don't like it when people tell us what to do, right? We're like petulant children. Anybody ever, in here have children? Anybody have a two-year-old? Anybody have a 15-year-old? They're just about the same, only not as tall. Am I right? Right. It's the same idea. Why? We're at different phases of our life, but you know what we're doing? We're typically, we're rebelling against authority. A two-year-old's like, uh-uh, I'm not doing that. I, am, I saw a video. I'm not, even gonna, I'm not even kidding. Savannah and I are watching this in, like, with some, some degree of like, horrified fascination today. We saw a parenting expert, and I use the term expert loosely, uh, from Australia, try, trying to teach parents how they were supposed to ask their infant child's permission to change their diaper. I'm not even kidding you. She was completely serious. And this dad was like, I think I'll try it. So, of course, okay, you guys know this isn't going to go over well, right? So he lays the, the baby down on the changing table, and he said, so he's got like a three-month-old. He says, you know, Daniel, I'm going to change your diaper. Is that okay? And the baby's like. <laughs> he says, no, no, I need a yes or a no. Because you're going to get a diaper. Daniel, can I change your diaper? Just blink for yes. And Daniel's like. And he says, you're, you're going to get a diaper rash, right? And so now, then it goes back, pans back to this woman who's trying to teach parents that they are not the authority in the life of their child. This is what's happening in the school systems right now. This is what's happening in the United Nations in the Convention on the Rights of a Child. You should look it up. But we know that parents have been given authority in the lives of their children. Why? Because the Bible teaches us that that's the way it is. And the laws of God are like the laws of gravity, right? They govern the universe. Gravity doesn't care if, I'm gonna, if I decide right now that I'm going to uh, go over and, and talk to my friend and Alana and just forget that and, and just go, eh, stairs, I don't matter. Well, actually, you could probably, you can defy the laws of gravity, so don't listen to me. This isn't for you. So the rest of us, if I decide to walk off this, this stage right now and I decide gravity doesn't exist, gravity doesn't care if I believe it or not, right? Gravity's going to have the last say. Gravity's going to go, bummer for you, bang, down she goes, right? The laws of God are the same way. They govern the universe. And we need to be able to talk about them without laying down our shield of faith and without laying down the sword of the Spirit, which is what? The Word of God. How many Christians are getting onto the battlefield today and we're setting aside the Word of God because people have told us it's no longer relevant? They've said it doesn't matter. You shouldn't be referring to that, that, that old-fashioned book, the Bible, because it was written so long ago. But I'm telling you what, this, the, the word of God is your weapon, the sword of the spirit. Don't ever go onto the battlefield without the sword of the spirit. This is your weapon. This is where truth comes from. I want to encourage you today to learn to do what Jesus told us to do, which is to speak the truth in love. We need to be speaking the truth in love. And I believe that what's happening so often in the church right now is that we've been, we have been uh, made to be afraid. And we've been shamed into silence. And our silence is our acquiescence. Our silence is a thing that says, it's all right, it's all right. God's okay with whatever you want to do. So listen, I fly out of Portland all the time. Uh, several times a month I fly off into the East Coast to speak. And just a couple of years ago, I was getting on a plane and... Uh, and, you know, any, anybody knows, well, you know this, if you want to get, make it here by, you know, dinner time, you got to get up at three in the morning in Portland to catch, to catch a flight. Am I right? Yes. It's a very tiring experience trying to come and visit you people on the East Coast from Portland. So I'm, I, I'm uh, this time I'm going to Chicago and then ultimately to Knoxville, Tennessee, and I get on a plane and it's very early in the morning and I'm really hoping that everybody on the plane is as sleepy as I am, right? So I put, I, I put my um, headphones on, which if you don't travel very much, people that get on airplanes with headphones, that's the universal sign for don't talk to me. It's just like sign language for travelers, right? So I get on the plane and I have my, my headphones on and, I, and I, um, I sit down and the woman to my right, I'm in the middle seat, right, because toward the back of the plane because God's been doing a sanctifying work in my life through the process of airline travel. 
So I'm sitting in this middle seat, and I look to the woman on my right, and I say, hey, you know, good morning, and she goes, hey. And I'm like, all right, good. She is not going to talk to me. I can tell, right? She put down her shade, and she just went to sleep. And I was like, perfect. And I'm thinking about all the work I'm going to get done and all the things that I'm going to accomplish on my six-hour flight from Portland to Chicago. And I'm thinking about this, right? And the guy comes in next to me, and he sits down next to me, and he goes, good morning. And I was like, ooh, morning person, <laughs> you know. You guys ever sit down next to a morning person when you're not the morning person? It's like a jolt, right? He goes, where are you going? Which I thought was an interesting question since we're all on a flight to Chicago, <laughs> right? And so I said, well, I'm going to, you know, to Chicago. <laughs> where are you going? He goes, Chicago. No, this is amazing. I, I have to understand, I know I'm being a little bit sarcastic because I don't want to tell him where I'm actually going because then he'll ask me what I'm doing. And if I don't want to talk to people, there's two things I avoid on airplanes, right? The first thing I avoid is I don't tell him I have seven children because people just, they, you know, their mouths hang open or they, then they want to say, well, don't you know how that works? And then I have to talk about how I know how it works and I, we like it. And it's awkward, you know, these conversations you have with strangers on airplanes, you're right? And so uh, I'm, not, I'm trying really hard not to tell him that. And I'm trying not, I really don't want him to know that I homeschool my children because that's another thing. And so I'm trying to keep, you know, some of these details to myself and sort of keep the conversation very vague. But this gentleman is like the most, he's the friendliest guy I have ever met on the friendly, on the unfriendly skies, the friendliest person. And he's asking me all these questions. And finally he was like, well, what's your final destination? And I said, well, what's your final destination? He goes, oh, Chicago. And I was like, shoot, you know. I said, what are you doing in Chicago? He said, I'm a teacher. And I was like, really? Where do you teach? And he tells me where he teaches, like the most liberal university in the entire state of Oregon. So I'm mentally making a note now of all the things I definitely do not want to talk about these things. And the list is getting longer and longer and longer. And as I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, you know what? I kind of think we've blown it. Like in, in our decision not to talk, like when I grew up, my parents told me, they're, you know, Thanksgiving. Heidi, don't talk. We, this is what our family does not talk about. We do not talk about religion, and we do not talk about politics. Do you guys do that here? Uh, yeah, okay. So, But you know what? Now we have a entire generation who literally doesn't know how to talk about it. We can't engage unless we're throwing bombs at each other over our computer screens. Am I right? And so I'm sitting next to this guy, and I'm thinking about how I don't want to talk about this simple A because I'm trapped on an airplane, and there's just nowhere to go. And B, because I'm thinking, do I really, am, am I really ready to engage? Right? Am I really ready to talk about this stuff? So he finally he says, so, uh, you know, wheels up. We're taking off. I can see Portland disappearing behind me. <laughs> and he says, so, um, so are you married? And I'm like, yep. <laughs> yes, I am. Oh, yes. Do you have children? <laughs> yep. Yes, I do. I'm looking at the woman next to me sleeping, and I'm thinking, you lucky, that is the way to do it. You just fall asleep, and then people are too afraid to, like, wake you up and start asking you questions. I said, I do have children. He said, we said that's awesome. He goes, how many kids do you have? And I was like, seven. <laughs> he goes, oh, my word. I didn't realize people in Portland were still doing that. I'm like, I know. It's, it's crazy, this little crazy little thing we're still doing. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, he's like, that, you must be exhausted. I said, yes. I am so tired. You just have no idea. He goes, well, he goes, you're, he's a girl. My, my hat is off to you. And I said, thank you. So where do your kids go to school? And I took my headphones off, wrapped the cord, kicked them under my seat. You know, I was like, oh, I homeschool. And he was like, no, you homeschool. Why, why, why would anyone do that? And I'm like, I have no idea. I just don't even know. And he goes, this is so awesome. I've always wanted to talk to one of you. And I'm like, I'm sure. Now, in my head, I'm thinking, this guy, I'm going to wind up in this guy's thesis, right? So I'm in my head, I'm like, oh, man, this, you know, this is going to be, this is getting harder and harder. And he's like, do you mind if I ask you some questions? I was like, nope. Go right ahead. We got six hours, okay? This Let's have us some fun. Let's do it. All right, keep in mind, I want you guys to picture us, all right? We're about as different as two people could possibly be. And the reason I tell you this story is because God wants you to be ready. We are called to be ambassadors. In Corinthians, the, Bible, the Paul was instructing the Corinthian men and women, and he was saying, listen to me, you are therefore Christ's ambassadors. I implore you on Christ's behalf, implore people around you, be reconciled to God. 
That is what God has asked us to do. And women, you have been given charge, especially over children. You have been given a tremendous responsibility. And so I'm sitting there. I want you to picture because it's such a great, it's such a great microcosm of God's heart for us, right? So I'm this, you know, uh, this pasty white conservative homeschool mom of seven. And I've got a single black man, liberal professor from a university sitting right next to me. And we're going to have a conversation. And that's exactly how we should be doing things. We should be talking to each other. But really, I was crying out to the Lord. I'm like, I don't even know. Like, I haven't had any coffee. I'm like, you know, ding, 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 you know, wheels up. And he's like, all right. I got my first question. I'm like, all right. And he goes, what do you think about gay marriage? And I was like, wow, right out of the gate. You know, I'm waiting for, I don't know, a birth control question. That was what I was, I was all geared up for the birth control question. And then he just, woo, he went over, he kind of, he kind of sighed, like, you know, I was like, wow, I wasn't ready for that. And, and I literally was like, Father, help me because I want to communicate how much you love this man. The Bible says in John that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that none of, none of us should perish, but that all of us would have eternal life. We are so loved by God. And that is his heart, isn't it? It's his message to this generation. And so I'm sitting there thinking, this is not a great way to, uh, turn, uh, to uh, start a conversation with somebody that you don't know why, because it's so polarizing. It's so polarizing. And so in my spirit, I was asking the Lord, I was like, Father, help me so I can communicate, so I can answer his questions the way that you'd want me to, but that I can, can communicate your great love for this person, that you love him. And so I, I felt like I sort of stumbled around a little bit, and then I, I, I said, you know what, can I tell you a little bit about myself before we just dive off the, the deep end and all the cultural hot topics of the day? And he said, no problem, we've got six hours. He's like, I know, <laughs> I know. I said, have you ever been to the Portland Zoo? And he looked at me a little, like, puzzled, you know, like, yes, not what that has to do with gay marriage, you know, but yes, I have been to Portland. I said, me too. He said, I bet you live at the Portland Zoo with all those kids. And I'm like, yep, uh, kind of. <laughs> Annual passes and all that. Yep, that's me, crazy homeschool mom of seven, pretty much living at the zoo. <laughs> and I said, you know what? I said, I, they have a brand new elephant exhibit at the zoo. Did you know that? He said, no, I didn't know that. I said, it's true. They have a brand new exhibit. I said, did you, have you ever been to, I said, it sounds really benign, but it's totally awesome. The American wolf exhibit, have you ever seen that? And he's like, no. I said, you should totally go next time. It's amazing. The penguins are incredible. The new, there's a new exhibit. It's amazing. I said, you know what they added last year? He said, no, I don't know. What did they add? I said, they added an insect zoo, as if we'd ever want to go there. And you know what my kids did? And he's like, no, I don't know. I said, my kids held the tarantula. If you're dumb enough, they'll let you do that. If you put out your hand, they'll put a big old spider as big as your hand right in it. And I watched my daughter pick up that tarantula, and I was like, I am not doing my job. She's not afraid of the spider. Like, I'm afraid of it. So you guys are afraid of spiders, like little spiders. And I'm just screaming for my husband that that's me. I said, you know what? You can, you can hold a tarantula or they'll let you hold a hissing Madagascar cockroach. He was like, that does not sound like fun. I was like, right? But my kids love it. He's like, I bet they do. Right? I said, you ever notice that the sun comes up? We're riding, we're riding into, the, into the sunrise now, heading east. You ever notice that the sun comes up right on time every day with incredible accuracy and we can predict it to within minutes of when it will come up over the horizon? He said, yeah. And I said, you notice like at the heat of the morning, at the heat of the day, the hottest part of the day, the sun is never so close to the earth that it burns us up and never too far away that we'd freeze to death. Do you ever, do you ever notice that? And he's like, he goes, well, I don't, I don't really think about it, but yeah, that's true. And I said, yeah, right. And then, then it goes down. With like incredible accuracy, right on time, every day. He was like, oh, I, I hadn't thought about that. I said, you know what? I have held seven newborn infants in my arms and lost a baby to miscarriage. I said, no one will ever be able to convince me that there was some big bang somewhere and some primordial ooze, some little you know, cosmic puzzle somewhere, some puddle somewhere, and an amoeba crawled out of it. And that became a hissing Madagascar cockroach, and that became a zebra, and this became a penguin, and this became a platypus, and that became a, a giraffe, and this became an elephant, and you became you, and I became me, and the sun comes up at just the right time every day and doesn't burn anybody to death, and goes down at just the right time every night, uh, with, and we can predict the seasons and the changes. I said, I just can't believe that that just happened. I said, can, can you believe it? He said, I'm having a harder time. Why? Because it takes faith to believe that there is no God. It takes faith to believe in the theory of evolution. Scientists have been trying to prove the theory of evolution for, for a bazillion years and they're never going to be able to do it. Why? Because God said in Genesis, I created the heavens and the earth. 
I am the creator, and having a creator changes everything. If we believe that we have a creator, it changes, it should change the way that we look at the world. And I said, I believe I have a creator, and so my search for a creator took me to the Bible where God reveals himself as the creator. The questions that this generation are asking are good questions, and the answers are found in the word of God. What does the Bible say about male and female? He said, I created you male and female. What does he say about creation? He says, I created the heavens and the earth in the beginning, God. The first four words of the book of Genesis answer so many questions that this generation is asking. And so I told him, in my search for a creator, in my own brokenness, and we, got, we had a lot of time, I got to tell him about my brokenness. I said, in my brokenness, I began to look for a healer. And the Bible reveals itself as God's unfolding, his story, his love story to mankind. I said, the Bible said that God created me in his image. And it certainly would make, I said, you know what, I, I spoke at a camp several years ago, and I, I took a, a little, uh, like an outdoor school thing, you know, and they said, here, Heidi, take a pottery class. It's really easy. They lied to me. <laughs> Not easy. Those of you who throw pots, I applaud you. I made such a mess of my pot. I was trying really hard in the wheel thing, and I'm, I can't do eye-hand coordination. It was terrible. But I, I had that pot, and I thought, you know what? You know, because they, they were nice to me, and they decided to go ahead and fire it. <laughs> I'm sure they were like, well, we should throw that away, but she made it, so we'll fire it for her, and you can take it home as a souvenir of why you'll never become a potter. I thought, good idea. I'm going to give this to one of my kids for Christmas because I'm their mother, right? What are they going to say? Oh, mom, I don't like that. No, this will be like, this will be like the guilty thing on their shelf for the rest of their life. They can't throw it away because mom made it. Their kids will be like, why do you have that? I don't know. My mom gave it to me. She made it. Ooh, you know, that's awful. I said, but I'm going to give it to my daughter. And I'm, if I give it to her, it's going to come with instructions. And the instructions are going to say, don't put this in the oven over 350 degrees. It'll crack. Don't put it, don't leave it in a sink of water overnight because it'll degrade the material and the dish won't survive. Of course, they might do that on purpose and then go, I didn't read the instructions, right? Don't drop it on a hardwood floor because it won't survive the fall. Why am I telling her that? Because I know how that pot was made. I know everything that went into that pot. I know exactly what will be good for it and exactly what will be bad for it. And for whatever reason, even though it's ugly and misshapen, I love that pot, Right? And that's God's love letter to us. It's his word, the Bible. It's his instruction manual for life. God said that my blessings are never found outside of my boundaries. If you believe that God created you, then we better know how he says to live. Because he knows about us and he knows what's good for us. And in his word, all throughout his word, he tells us how to live. Everything from what, kind of, what, what we should and should not do with our bodies, even the food that we put into our bodies. God said, don't be drunk. Why? Ever met an alcoholic? They'll tell you why. God said, this is the way that you should live. I want you to live this way. Why? Not because he's the giant killjoy in the sky, but because he loves us and he knows what's best for us. And so I told this gentleman, I said, for that reason, because God said, I did not create you to, to behave in a manner unworthy. I did not create you to, to, to any sinful desire. We have every single one of us in this room has sinful desires. Some of us, our desires are sinful because they drive us toward we want to steal or we're, our propensity is to lie. Some of us, our propensity is what? For exaggeration, right? Which is sort of a white lie. Still lying, right? Some of us, our propensity is to not have one glass of wine with our dinner, but we're going to have three. And we know that we shouldn't, but we do it anyway. That's just sort of our bent. We all have things that we do that, we, that God says, don't do that. It's not good for you. And the same thing is true of homosexuality. Over, people are having, Christians have to do theological and doctrinal backflips to get away from this truth. And we're doing it because we're afraid. We're doing it because we've decided that God's word is no longer the authority in our lives and we can't depend on it. But I'm here to tell you that God's laws are like laws of gravity. We can depend on them. And we should. And I said, for that reason, you're never going to see me vote for something I know is going to ultimately hurt another human being. It's not because I don't love you. It's because I do love you. Because I believe that you have a creator. And that creator loves you. And he told you, this is exactly how I want you to live. If you want to find my blessing, live inside my boundaries. That is God's heart. And he was kind of quiet, and I was just like, oh, man, he's going to call the airplane police, and I'm going to get kicked <laughs> off my flight to Chicago. I'm never going to make it to Tennessee. And he leaned over, and he said, you know, he said, that might be the best argument I've ever heard against my point of view. But he said, I want to tell you something. The reason why it's hitting me the way it is isn't, he said, it is because of things you said, but mostly because I genuinely think that you love me. And I said, well, I do love you because God loves you, because God loved me, because he healed me in my own brokenness. And the Bible says that we have been charged 
to steward a message of hope. We have been given the ability to steward a message of hope to a generation that needs it. Listen to what happened. Uh, this is uh, Moses talking in Deuteronomy 8, verses 2 to 11. So this is, let me give you a little bit of, of context. This is the children of Israel getting ready to go into the promised land, right? So they've spent 40 years wandering in the desert. Why? Because they disobeyed God, right? And God was like, dude, you guys, all right, 40 years, take another lap around Mount Sinai. Let's figure it out, right? But we don't want to do that. We want to rebel against God. And every time we do that, suffering is the sure result. And so the Israelites have been suffering for 40 years, wandering around the desert. They're getting ready to go into the promised land where abundant resources will be available to them and where they will face the temptation of ease and affluence, which is what we face in this nation. Listen to what he said. This is Moses. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothes did not wear out and your feet did not swell during these 40 years. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. Observe the commands of the Lord your God, walking in obedience to him and, rev and revering him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with brooks and streams and deep springs gushing into the valleys and hills, a land with wheat and barley, vines and fig trees, pomegranates, olives and honey, a land where bread will not be scarce and where you will lack nothing, a land where the rocks are iron and you can dig copper out of the hills." When you have eaten and been satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. And be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I am giving you this day. Why the warning? Why is Moses warning these people who have been suffering these 40 years as they're about to come into the land which God has given them? He's warning them. He's telling them the truth exists. And because we're comfortable, I think, in the church today, we've become comfortable with just living the way we live, and we've no longer decided to follow the ways of the Lord. I can, I can name probably five churches off the top of my head in Portland who are no longer teaching the truth of the word of God anymore. We're teaching a comfortable Christianity. And God said, don't forget my word. Don't stop walking in my ways. And today in the culture, what, we're, what I'm noticing that we're doing, and this is the temptation. This was my temptation on the airplane. It's happened to me many, many times after that as the Lord is teaching me how to engage with the world around me in truth and in love, which is what we're called to do. The temptation is to sacrifice truth on the altar of a misguided mercy. The temptation is to sacrifice truth on the altar of love. But listen, if you tell somebody uh, what they want to hear and you don't tell them the truth and you try to be as loving as, as you can and it's devoid of truth, it's not really love at all. If I know that my teenage son is speeding around the hills of Battleground, Washington, and I tell him, son, if you continue driving like this, you will get in an accident, I can either do that or I can say, wow, I've just noticed that you woo, really put the pedal to the metal. That must be a lot of fun. But if I don't tell him the dangers of his behavior, I'm not doing him any favors. He might get upset with me. He might say, mom, you killed Joy. I'm having some fun. Leave me alone. I know how to drive. Your your kids ever say that to you? Mom, mom, I got it, okay. Thank you very much for playing. I have a lovely parting gift for you, right? You ever feel that from your kids? And God is saying, don't forget, don't forget who you are. When we speak, but we don't have love in our voice, if we tell the truth, but we don't have love in our voice, and the Bible says we sound like a gong or a clanging cymbal. Anybody ever heard that? Anybody old enough to remember the gong show, right? Right? That's what the Bible says we sound like. So truth without love results in injury. But love without truth isn't love at all. And it results, ultimately, the Bible says it results in death. We have to be able to speak the truth of God. So who are we? First of all, we are made in the image of God. Women, that's who you are. You have been made in the image of God. You are daughters of the King of Kings. You serve the Lord of Heaven's armies, the one who spoke the heavens into being. He spoke and the world came into being. Why are we running? Why are we running? I'm thinking about all of the things that God has given us in this time. And God said, I made you in my image. And he created us in his image. And surely this must have something to do with why we're here. That he put us here right now for such a time as this. I love the word of God. And I've been studying it since I was very young. But I'll tell you what, what I, something I've noticed in my life, and maybe some of you can relate to this. I've noticed in the last several years especially, which is why I wrote the scripture writing challenge, which I hope you guys will check out. I brought it with me today. 
It's just, it's just a verse. It's a passage in the Word every day that you can write down. Everything is dated, so it doesn't matter what day it is. You can open it up, and you can write the Word of God. There is power, women, in the Word of God. The Bible says that God's Word is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and it is able to cut through all of the lies that you are seeing in the culture today and illuminate truth for you, which is what you need if you're going to survive in the culture that we live and be the ambassador that God has called you to be. And I noticed in my reading of the word, I was, I was thinking about my struggle to read it. And I thought, you know what? This is exactly where the enemy wants because I wake up every day and it is my intention to get into the word of God. But I remember, oh, I have laundry that needs to be done. And I forgot to take the roast out and defrost it last night. And I can't remember where my pressure cooker is. And I bet you anything, the kids forgot to put the clothes from the washing machine as a dryer. And now they smell like mold. So I better get in there and start the load again because everyone's going to tell me they don't have socks. And all the things that roll through my head as a mother. And as a wife, I begin to think about those things, and that is what I do. I get up, and I start going around my day, and it's a victory for the devil because he knows he was able to distract me from getting to the one thing that was going to help me get through that day, and that's being in the Word of God. He got me by acquiescence, by just seeing something in front of me and feeling that it was more pressing than what God asked me to do, to lay down my weapon and head out onto the battlefield without it. I want to encourage you not to lay down your weapon. I watch, uh, with, I've watched several uh, renditions of the story of the book of Esther. If you haven't had a chance to read the book of Esther, boy, if you want to get fired up, just read the story about that girl, right? Faced incredible odds. And the Bible says she did it through prayer and fasting. There's power in prayer. I have a history uh, timeline on my wall in my schoolroom. It's pretty old now. It's kind of yellowed and tattered, and you have to look past the tear stains on it and where the parrot ate through 1740. Just if you can, you can get off the bat, you'll see that, in, that there are many incredible people on my timeline. People that have made a mark for the Lord in the culture. People who have done wicked things in the world. There are many, many people's pictures and faces on my timeline and dates on my timeline because I've been teaching my children about history. Because the Bible says uh, that, that we should know where we came from. And I'm teaching my children about history, and if you go just a little bit past the appointment of the first African-American to the Supreme Court of the United States, you'll see a date that's very important to me. It's probably not on your timeline. 1967 is the birth of my husband. If you go just a little bit farther than that, you'll see my birth on the timeline. And if you go a little bit farther in 1989, you'll see that Jane Heidi St. John got married. God brought us together to do something for the kingdom. God never does anything apart from a kingdom purpose. If you're here this morning, it's because of divine appointment. If you go just a little bit farther, in 1991, you'll see the birth of my first child, Savannah, is on the timeline. And in 1993, God said, now it's time for Sierra St. John to become part of my story. His story, his story is really God's story, right? It's his unfolding, and we're able to see it. We are here for just a nanosecond of history. We are. Just for a moment, just for a blip. And I want my children to see that their place on the timeline is no less significant than Esther's place or Moses' place or anyone else who had, has had an impact on human history, that God has appointed them to be right here, right now, for such a time as this. And the same thing is true of you. Women, women of God, you were born for this. You were born for this time in history. God looked down and he said, right now, it's time for Alana to join my story. Because he knew that Alana would be here right now today. Right now, God said, you are here. And I want to do something with your life. And I hear so many women, I was speaking a couple of weekends ago uh, in Cannon Beach in Oregon. I was speaking to mothers there on a similar topic as I am today. And over the break, I had a woman come to me in absolute brokenness and tears. And she said, my husband left me four years ago. Left me with five children, left me in the middle of the night. She said, I can't get back onto the battlefield anymore. I'm so broken, I'm so worn out, I'm so tired, I feel abandoned, I feel used. And here, here was what God said to me for her. And I want you to hear this today because it's so important. Your place on God's timeline has no bearing on your circumstance. It has no bearing on your circumstance. Because God said that he will be with you wherever you are. If you are in this room today and you are a single mom, I wanted to encourage you today. God says that if your husband leaves you, he will be your husband. Now, I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings in here, and I'm glad my husband's not here to hear this, but I'll tell you what, having God for your husband, better than having any human being, <laughs> right? So in many respects, you're ahead of the game, right? We, we, we come before the Lord and we say, Father, you said in your word that if I am abandoned, you will never leave me, you will never forsake me. You are a father to the fatherless and a husband to the widow and to the woman who has been abandoned. That is the Lord, the God of heaven's army saying, get up, get back onto the battlefield. I am right here by your side. I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. 
and I will keep my promises. If God makes a promise to you, women, you can take it to the bank. Anytime God says something in his word, I was talking to the leaders here last night and we were talking about God's promise to Solomon. When Solomon was coming to uh, take over for his father, King David, he had the wisdom to come before the Lord and admit that he didn't know what the heck he was doing. Anybody ever go into motherhood like that? Why the Lord chooses to give young, inexperienced women children to raise is beyond me. I always, when I remember leaving the hospital with Savannah thinking, she should really be with my mom. Because <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. You guys ever feel that way? And God said, I want to use you. I am never going to leave you. And he said to Solomon, he said, Solomon, because you've asked for wisdom and not for wealth or for success or for the death of your enemies. I love that he threw that in there. But since you've asked for wisdom, I will give it to you and you will be wiser than any man who has ever lived before you and there will never be anyone as wise as you. How many of you in this room can tell me that you've ever heard of a man as wise as Solomon since the day of Solomon? No. No. And you never will. Why? Because God said there never would be anyone like him again. And when God says something, even the little things in his word, even the things that we tend to overlook, when God says something, women, you can take it to the bank. When God tells you, these are my instructions, live by them. Live by them. You want to experience the blessing of God? Walk inside his boundaries. You want to experience God's victory? Don't live as a victim. Live as a woman of influence who knows who she is in the Lord. If you've been abandoned, God says, I am with you. If you are broken, God says, I am your healer. I am Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals. Some of you guys have been following me on Facebook, and you know that my nephew Bobby was hit, was hit by a car last June. He was hit backing into his driveway. He'd already taken his seatbelt off, and he was already mostly into his driveway. He was hit by a car going 55 miles an hour down a residential road, slammed into his car broadside, and the impact broke Bobby's neck in two places, shattered his head, his skull, and it took them six hours to get the pieces of his skull out of his brain. They came to my sister and I in the waiting room, and they said, your son, to my sister, they said, your son will never walk again. He is a quadriplegic. He has sustained an injury known as a DAI, diffuse anoxal injury. They said, if he wakes up, he probably won't remember you. He will probably not be able to talk again. And my sister, imagine, you guys, we're at, we're at Emanuel Hospital in downtown Portland. Imagine that the doctors come to you. This is why we need to know the word of God. We have two responses to make in that time. In that moment, when something like that happens, we have two choices to make. We can either choose to live in fear or we can choose to say, all right, all right, we see the situation like Nehemiah said to the people when they recognized that the walls around Jerusalem were broken down. By the way, God is a fan of walls around cities. I'm just saying. When Nehemiah realized that the walls around the city were broken and they were susceptible and open to enemy attack, he looked at the, at the condition of the wall and he looked at the Israelites and he spoke with such confidence and authority and he said, look at the situation we are in. We are in a terrible situation. But... We know the Lord of heaven's armies, and God's appointed time for us is now. And I looked at my sister, and she is weeping, and I am weeping, and I will never forget this night as long as I live. Because it was so dire, and we thought he was going to die. And I said, Heather, we serve the Lord of heaven's armies, and we decide now. We either believe God only when things are good, or we believe God when things are bad, but we still know that God is good. And we began to intercede for that boy and contend for that boy and pray for that boy. And we bust people in from all over the Portland Gresham area to come and sit out on the lawn with us and praise the name of Jesus. Do you guys want to find victory in your life? Praise the Lord in the dark places. Don't forget that God is good when things are bad around you. Yes, he's worthy of your praise. It's all right to clap. Do you do that here in Boston? It's okay. <laughs> you serve the healer. And we began to contend for the life of my nephew. And we took MRIs in and we prayed over those MRIs and we believed that they would change and they didn't. And we wept and we cried and we kept saying, Father, whether you heal Bobby here or you heal him in, in heaven, we know that you are the healer and we will speak of your fame and we will make your name famous as long as you give us breath. And about six weeks later, Bobby began to move his left side. And several weeks after that, he began to open his eyes. And I'm telling you what, I've never seen anything like it in my life. I watched the Lord of Heaven's armies heal a lame boy. Some of you are aware that just a few weeks ago, Bobby went back to school. Just a year, just a little uh, less than a year since his accident. Truly a miracle of God's healing power. And I think sometimes we forget 
who we belong to. Sometimes we forget who we serve, who is capable of doing what it is that we ask him to do. So who are we? We are created in the image of God. God created us. He created us in this incredible mess that we live in to bring him glory and to give him praise in every situation, in every circumstance that we face. We are also the shepherds of this generation. If you're taking notes, you should write that down because I want to encourage you no matter what's happened in your life, God does not want it to quiet your witness. Sometimes we go through suffering. I grew up in an abusive home. The police were at my house a whole lot when I was growing up. And I believe now as a, as a woman of God who has been out in the battlefield for many years that Satan wanted to use that to quiet my witness. And he would do it through panic attack and he would do it through shame and he would do it through abuse and he would do it through abandonment. And God said, I'm your healer. I'm your provider. I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. You are mine. You are not the daughter of Jim Ginn. You are the daughter of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who's loved you with an everlasting love and will never leave you or forsake you. Get onto the battlefield. I've got something for you to do. That's the Lord. That's who you serve. Some of you are sitting in this room today and you're saying, you know what, I don't have children at home anymore. Maybe you don't have children at all or maybe your children are grown and gone. You know, one of the most interesting passages that I read in all of scripture that tells me that we have responsibility for this generation is found in Psalm 70 and I'm going to read it for you. Give ear, my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will, open my, I will open my mouth as a parable and utter dark sayings from old things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, but tell them to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. This is David reminding the people not to forget. He's talking to the Israelites who God parted the Red Sea for them, right? I like to think that if I was an Israelite and I saw God part the Red Sea, I would never forget. But they did. They forgot. I would like to, I would like to think that I will never forget the day I saw Bobby Asa take a step after the doctor said he would never move from the shoulders down. I would like to, I would like to think I'll never forget. But I know that if I don't stop talking about it, if I don't keep giving glory and praise to God, I will forget because I'm a sheep. And I don't know about you guys, but I grew up on a farm in Boring, Oregon, and sheep are dumb. There's a reason that Jesus calls us sheep. <laughs> right? And so the psalmist Asaph is here, and he's telling you, don't forget to tell the children of the glorious things that God has done. He said, in other words, let me just paraphrase, stop whining and start praising. Verse 5, he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, and he commanded our fathers to teach their children. He commanded. He commanded our fathers to teach their children. There's one generation. So the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn. There's three generations. And they would arise to tell them to their children. That's four generations. So if you're a grandmother or great-grandmother in this room, God says you're not done. You have influence. You have influence over four generations. God is telling you, mothers, if you are brand new mothers in you, this is the beginning of your influence over four generations. The decisions that we make right now will affect four generations from now. That's what God is saying. He's saying, arise and tell the truth to your children. Why? Verse 7, so that they would set their hope in God and not forget the works of God's, but keep his commands and that they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast and whose spirit was not faithful to God. Listen, what the psalmist Asaph is saying right here is that your actions have outcomes. Your actions have consequences. Your inaction has consequences. I was just speaking for, for, a, for a group of women in Southern Oregon about two months ago, and we were talking about the abortion law on record there. Abortion has the worst, uh, Oregon has the worst abortion law in the history of the nation. And so I asked the church this question. I'm going to ask it of you today. I don't know what your abortion law is here, but I know it's legal. Where is the church? Where are God's people? This has happened on our watch and we can blame the millennials and we can whine and cry about the millennials, but I want to ask you a question. Where were the parents of the millennials? You have been given charge over this generation. You've been given the ability to influence a generation. Don't waste it. Don't let the enemy silence your witness. The Bible says that we are dependent on God. We are absolutely dependent on him. Independence from God is an illusion. Even the most ardent atheist is dependent on God for the air that he breathes. We are dependent on God. And we have to look to him as our shepherd. We are who God says we are. God says we are image bearers made in his image. We have been given responsibility to shepherd this generation. If you're an aunt in this room, if you're a big sister in this room, God is saying, I am giving you influence. Don't waste 
your influence. We are men and women under authority. We are. And as women and as human beings, we're like the Israelites. We're stubborn people. We don't like to be people under authority. Everybody, anybody see that? Have you ever noticed that in your culture? Anybody see it in the government? Anybody watch people rioting in downtown? Hmm? We don't like to be people under authority. But the Bible says that we are men and women under God's authority. And this authority has already determined how we should live. God's blessing is found inside his boundary. The world is lying to you about who you are. The world would tell you that your life is of no more worth than the life of an animal. God said that your life is precious to him, born and unborn. God said that he knew you before anyone else knew about you. While you were being knit together in your mother's womb, God knew you. You know, listen, I imagine a room this big that there are many, there are many women in here who have experienced an abortion, and I want to speak to you directly for just a moment. I am not here to bring condemnation to you. That is not the heart of the Father. The Bible says in Romans, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And I know about you, but I live on the message of that verse. The Lord of Heaven's army says to you, I love you. I forgive you. Step up, get onto the battlefield, and tell your story. Don't let the enemy silence your witness. Don't let the enemy tell you that you don't have a story to tell. You do have a story to tell. You serve the Lord of Heaven's armies, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords, and He loves you. And He loves you. The enemy would lie to you. I can almost hear Eve in the Garden of Eden. You remember when she's, when she's uh, being tempted to take the, the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And you can almost see the enemy slither up to her. And she's looking at that fruit and she's thinking, I don't know, maybe it's not that bad. Maybe what God said not to do wouldn't be that big of a deal. And the enemy is saying, you will not surely die. Oh, no. You'll be like God. Your eyes will be opened, you'll see. And eventually what? She believes the lie of the enemy and she decides to disobey God and the rest, as they say, is history. And the enemy is lying to you today just like he lied to Eve in the garden. He's telling you that this ugly thing that you're looking at, this thing that you're watching on television, this thing that you're allowing into your life, this ugly thing is really beautiful. The enemy would tell you that what God said is wrong is really right after all. That's what we're seeing in the culture right now as the, as the church, as God's people, lays down the sword of the spirit and we, believe to, we begin to usher in the lies of the enemy. It starts by saying that we don't believe that God's word is the authority anymore. I want to encourage you today back to a place of believing that your identity comes from the Holy Spirit and to say, let the Holy Spirit guide you. You know, we had a president in office for eight years, Barack Obama. We elected him on two words. Who knows what they were? Hope and change. Why? Because we are a nation that is desperate for hope and change. If you know Jesus, you have the hope and change inside of you that the entire world is looking for, and it will never be found in a president. I don't care who he is. Hope and change is never found apart from Jesus. That's where it begins. If God can take a broken 19-year-old girl like me, who is about as broken as a human being can get, and set her on her feet and remind her through his word and through the people around her how loved she is. The reason I'm standing here today, you guys, is because of the prayers of my grandparents who never gave up on me and never stopped telling me who I was, even when I didn't believe it myself. And when I finally let the truth of God's word sink down deep into my soul, it changes you. You can't help but shout it from the rooftops. People sometimes say to me, Heidi, you're so bold and brave. No, I'm not. I was diagnosed with a panic disorder when I was 20 years old. I was put on panic medication when I was 20. They said, this will, this will never get better. You know who we serve? We serve the healer, Jehovah Rapha. He determines what we do with our gifting. God said his strength is made perfect in weakness. So I want you to think with me for just a second about your weakness because we all have them, except for you. You may not have any weakness. I'm still looking at you. We all have weakness. And God says in his word, his grace is sufficient. When grace visits you, how many of you guys have experienced God's grace and his healing? Yes. When grace visits you, it changes you. He said, my grace is sufficient. He said, my grace, meaning his forgiveness, his presence. He said, my grace is sufficient. It's enough. It's enough. He said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. So if you're sitting here today and you're thinking about a weakness in your life, God's heart for you today is to know that his power is found in your weakness. Give it to the Lord and let him see what he'll do. When the Lord asked me to start speaking, I, can, I will never forget it as long as I live because I remember him clearly. I was asked to take someone's place at a, a women's conference and they didn't show up. 
And the organizer of the event said, our speaker didn't show up, you, we want you to do it. And I was like, oh, no, no, no. I don't know if you know this, but I have panic attacks. I'm an anxiety girl, you know, able to leap to the worst conclusion in a single bound. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> so when we prayed about it, we think God would have you give a word. So I stood up there for 10 minutes, knees knocking, my heart was racing, just like it was before I came up here this afternoon. And the Lord of Heaven's army said, thank you very much, Heidi. I want to use you as a vessel. I want people to see that my strength is made perfect in weakness. That's what he wants to do with you. He wants you to bring a living, breathing testimony to a world around you that is literally dying for the hope and change that is only ever found in Jesus. That is your message. That is the hope that God has for this generation. It is a message we're sharing. The message of Jesus will never pass away. The Bible says in Isaiah that the grass will wither and the flower will fade, but God's word will stand how long? Forever. The culture may shift under your feet. The ground may shift. People may change the definition of marriage and tell you that men can become women and women can become men. And your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth. But, but the Bible says that my word will stand forever. And so when the culture shifts, God does not shift. When the culture changes its mind, God does not change his mind. God said, I have an everlasting love for you. I have spoken to your life. I have put you here for a purpose. And if you'll follow me, if you'll turn your life over to me, if you'll say, God, I believe your word. I'm going to pick up my shield of faith, which is believing God's word, taking it at face value, and then acting on it, not sitting and being quiet, acting on God's word. And he has a blessing in it for you. There is a blessing, women, in following God. Don't let anything quiet your witness. You have a message of hope and change inside of you because of Jesus. Amen. Amen. This is the Lord of Heaven's armies reaching down to you right now, saying, wherever you are, I'm going to change your life. And I'm going to make you an ambassador of hope and change, an ambassador of the living God who makes his appeal through you. You have that ability because of the passion and love of God for you. It's an amazing story, is it not? And it's God's story for you. Let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Father, I thank you. I thank you that you look down on this broken world that we've so messed up. And that you sent your son Jesus as a little baby into it, who has experienced our suffering and, our, and rejection. And he died in our place. Father, I thank you for your word, which is an incredible love story. It's you telling us that you love us, that you created us. And that sin is a sickness in our life right now. And you've said this is how you find victory over sin. You said that as we follow you, you offer us the fruits of the Spirit, which are patience and peace and gentleness and goodness and joy and self-control. Father, we, we're struggling. We're struggling to pick up the sword of the Spirit. We're struggling to lift high the shield of faith. We're struggling to protect our children from the lies that are all around us. And so, Father, by the power of your Spirit, would you invade this place? Holy Spirit, would you invade the city of Boston? I pray that Boston would never be the same again. Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would work so powerfully in the women who are here today that they, would not, they could not help but go out and shout from the rooftops that the hope and change that we are desperate for is found in Jesus. Father, we pray for repentance over our country. Father, may we get on our knees and do exactly what you said in Chronicles. May your people fall on our knees and say, Father, forgive us. We're crying out to you, Father. We ask for strength as we parent our children. We ask for, as grandparents, we ask for strength as we shepherd the parents of our grandchildren. Lord, your word says that we're responsible for four generations. I pray for every young mother in this room right now, every young person, that we would be reminded that the decisions that we make today will affect four generations. And Father, that you will one day ask us to give an account for our actions. Father, I pray that you'd fill these women with courage. Your word says that we cried out to you, that we cry out to you, and you make us bold. Boldness doesn't come from the world. It does not come from earthly wisdom. It is found at the foot of the cross. And so, Father, we pray for boldness and courage. Says, Father, I pray that you'd fill us with your love. Your word says that they'll know we are Christians by our love. Help us to speak your truth in love. Help us to walk in step with your Holy Spirit, never in front and never behind. Help us to walk in step with you. And Father, I pray that you would make us passionate about your word, that every woman in here would go home with a desire to know you better and walk more rightly with you. 
thank you for what you're doing here today, Lord, and for what you will continue to do. We worship you, Father. We look forward to your return, and we say we are who you say we are, daughters of the King of Kings, daughters of the Most High God, loved, redeemed, forgiven, made new. Thank you, Father, for your word and for its promise to us. May we go out and share it with everyone who our lives touch. Give us the strength and the courage, Father, for we ask these things in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much.